Hera was the last born daughter of the primordial titans Cronus, god of time, and Rhea, goddess of fertility. Cronus, fearful of a prophecy which foretold his downfall at the hands of one of his offspring, devoured all of his children to prevent the prophecy from becoming reality. Rhea, no longer able to watch as Cronus swallowed her children, birthed their last-born son Zeus in secret so that he could grow into adulthood and return to usurp his father and rescue his siblings. After saving his beautiful sister Hera from their father's stomach, Zeus immediately fell in love. He began to court his sister, who rejected all of his advances. Zeus eventually grew impatient with her repeated refusal and hatched a plot to trick her instead. He disguised himself as a cuckoo and flew onto her windowsill, pretending to be chilled by the cold outside. When she saw the freezing bird, Hera's empathy could not be ignored, and so she allowed the cuckoo inside and held it to her breast for warmth. Zeus's deception had worked, and in Hera's moment of vulnerability, he transformed back into his normal form and forced himself upon her. Hera felt such intense shame after being raped that she finally agreed to marry Zeus, and a sacred wedding took place which was celebrated by all of the other unknowing gods and titans. After the wedding, Hera and Zeus went on a 300-year honeymoon, during which many of their children were born. And though they shared many happy moments, Hera never forgot what Zeus had done, and never forgave his horrific sin against her. As time passed, and fellow gods and goddesses also began to hold grudges against Zeus for his repeated wrongdoings, Hera gathered them all and plotted rebellion against her husband. When the time was right, she drugged Zeus's drink and he fell into a deep sleep. She called upon the others who helped tie Zeus to his chair with a hundred knots and basking in their triumph, they took Zeus's thunderbolt, the source of his godly powers. Hera and the others had not planned on what to do next, however, and began to argue over how to proceed with their revolution. Briareus, one of the lesser gods still loyal to Zeus, overheard the bickering and snuck in to free his lord. As the hundred knots were untied by Briareus' hundred hands, Zeus was roused from his slumber. He took back his thunderbolt and gazed upon the rebellious lot before him with rage. They fell to their knees and begged for mercy, including Hera, who was revealed to be their leader. Zeus bound Hera with golden shackles and chained enormous anvils to her feet. He hung her from the heavens for all to see as she was screaming in agony and none were brave enough to defy Zeus and save her. After a day and night of torturous pain, Zeus freed Hera on one condition, that she would never again plot rebellion against him. She swore the oath and henceforth could no longer harm Zeus directly. Her vengeful will would not be undone, however, And for the remainder of her days, though she remained a faithful wife to Zeus, she witnessed Zeus's repeated infidelities. Hera's wrath fell upon all of Zeus's lovers and their offspring, dooming them to terrible fates because of Zeus's sins. Most people believe that the stories of Hera and Zeus are works of fiction, born out of the imagination of the ancient Greeks. However, the word myth originates from the Greek word mythos, meaning word 
or tale, or true narrative, referring not only to the means by which it was transmitted, but also to it being rooted in truth. Mythos was also closely related to the word mayo, meaning to teach or to initiate into the mysteries. I'm Brian Edwards, and I welcome you to join me as I tell what I believe to be the true story behind the mysterious tale of Velka, the goddess of sin, and the major events of the Age of Fire. This is Dark Souls, a new mythology. Hera, queen of the gods, was the Greek goddess of marriage and childbirth, and was often depicted holding a pomegranate, a symbol of both fertility and death, in her hands. When we see statues of Velka in the Dark Souls universe, they are usually of a cloaked woman cradling a child in her arms. In the previous episode of this series, I put forth the claim that the first sin which caused Velka to become the goddess of sin was committed by Gwen and the other lords against Velka's own children, the inheritors of the Dark Soul. Her soul. Velka could never forgive the other lords for what they have done, but she especially desired punishment for Gwen. For as she was the personification of dark, Gwen was the personification of light. Their incontrovertible connection would be the doorway to her plot for vengeance. She led Gwen to believe that she was drawn to him, tricking him into thinking that she was on the side of her fellow lords, despite their fearful sins against her offspring. Gwyn married Velka, who he had many children with. However, unlike the Immaculate Conception of the Children of Dark, these children shared both the dark and the light, causing them all to personify aspects of division. Their firstborn inherited lightning, and with it, his father's powerful fighting spirit, but also inherited his mother's immense potential for empathy. Gwendolyn inherited his father's masculinity and strong sense of propriety and order, but also his mother's femininity and proclivity for vengeance and chaos. They would go on to raise Gwendolyn as a daughter, for Gwen already had a firstborn heir. Guinevere inherited her father's nurturing dedication to the fire and sunlight, but also her mother's innocent fertility and desire for children of her own. And finally, Philianor, the most powerful of their children, inherited the essence of light that is the power to control time in existence, but also inherited the necessity of space that is the power to control matter and dimension, which is intrinsic to the dark. Though Gwyn loved all of his children, he also feared them, for he could see that they, like their mother, also had free will. Thus began Velka's punishment of Gwyn, as he watched his children, one by one, stray from the will of the fire, his will, and choose paths of their own. Their firstborn, inheritor of the power to destroy the dragons, instead felt sorrow for their plight having nearly been hunted to extinction. Enraged by his father's skewed perception of duty and honor, the firstborn destroyed the annals of history, which had been written by Gwyn, depicting a righteous war to eradicate the dragons. Gwyn banished his only son from Lordran for this betrayal, and wiped his name and image 
from all recollection. The nameless king fought on the side of the dragons henceforth, defending them against what he saw as an unjust fate. This event caused Gwyn great sadness, but it had only set the precedent for his other children to stray from his righteous path. While Gwyn was fraught with sorrow and neglectful of his usual supervision, Guinevere gave in to her curiosity about the outside world and strayed from home, taking two of her handmaidens with her. Filianor, able to see the passage of all time, knew what was about to transpire and what had already been done. She was aware of the first sin and her mother's vengeful will. Knowing that the only chance for humanity to escape the coming curse of the Age of Fire would lie in the reaccumulation of the Dark Soul, she left Lordron to protect the Ring City, where most of the Dark Soul's largest fragments resided. She used her power to shut the city off within a bubble universe where even her father could not trespass. Meanwhile, as Guinevere and her handmaidens wandered the streets of Anorlando, City of the Gods, they were taken in by Seath the Scaleless, who had been granted dukedom and a home of his own in the city. Seath only saw an opportunity to further his research on immortality, but Guinevere, in her innocence, was willing to cooperate with the experiment he proposed. Because, although Seath was a dragon and known to be treacherous, he had promised her something she always wanted. Children. Thus, from the unnatural union of Guinevere and Seath, were born twin half-dragon goddesses. Velka's time for true vengeance had come, and so she moved to seize the opportunity. She had been watching Guinevere the whole time, and when she saw the half-dragon children, she knew what they were capable of doing to the gods. Velka broke into Seath's mansion, and after a brief struggle with her daughter, was able to steal away one of the babies. She left Lordron and began to set her plot into motion, raising the child as her own. Guinevere returned home with her other daughter, and though Gwyn was detested by the creature, he did not kill his half-dragon grandchild. Instead, he locked her away, where he could wait and see what she would become, because his main concern was the news that Velka had stolen her twin, and that Filianor had disappeared, along with the Ring City. So began the roots of the occult rebellion led by Velka against the gods of Lordron. She named her stolen grandchild Priscilla and studied the gentle girl's supernatural power to kill the gods. From her point of view, Guinevere felt somehow responsible for her mother Velka and sister Filianor's strange actions, their departure from Lordron, and her father Gwyn's mournful rage. Gwyn now only looked upon her with grave disappointment, and turmoil was brewing amongst the remaining gods of Lordron. Unable to bear the weight of her guilty conscience, or the loss of her child, mother, and siblings, Guinevere fled Lordron, while Gwyn, his faithful knights, and the gods who remained pledged to the will of the fire, prepared for war. She settled down in a faraway land with Flan, a lesser god of flame who had also wished to abandon an Orlando. Flan cared for Guinevere greatly and eventually married her. 
they had many children of their own, far removed from the coming conflict or the dire events to follow. Guinevere, like her sister Filianor, would never return to Lordron. Gwendolyn, the ill-favored son who was treated as a daughter, felt a special kinship with his half-dragon niece, who was being kept under constant guard in a secluded tower. He named the girl Yorshka, and essentially raised the child, as her mother Guinevere was too overcome by grief and regret, and eventually disowned her altogether when she fled Lordron with Flan. Gwendolyn hoped to keep Yorshka innocent and happy, but he could not deny the darkness taking hold of his thoughts. He felt deceived by the one he loved most and who he thought loved him as much. His mother had always been there, even when his father was more enamored with the firstborn and only true son. The firstborn was gone though, along with all of Gwendolyn's family other than Yorshka and his impossible to please father, who was now more worried about war than Gwendolyn's loneliness. Vengeance was the only path left in Gwendolyn's darkened heart, and if he followed that path righteously enough, maybe his father would finally see him as a worthy heir. Yorshka was taught how to be dutiful to the first flame by Gwendolyn, but in doing so, he also influenced her perceptions to match his vengeful course. He passed on to Yorshka his personal mandate to destroy any who would threaten the absolute rule of the gods, corrupting her gentle nature. While Yorshka was being raised as an honorable protector of Lordron's seat of power, her twin sister, Priscilla, was learning the art of life hunt, a power strong enough to kill gods, which only the crossbred siblings possessed. Yorshka was unaware of this power, but Priscilla had a loving and encouraging mother to show her the way and to tell her all about the sins which remained unpunished in Lordron. Though Priscilla was still only a child, Velka felt prepared to return to An Orlando, and many who had left the city in the wake of her flight had already come to her in preparation to overthrow the three lords of the flame. Even Gwyn's most trusted friend and ally, Havel the Rock, once among the greatest dragon slayers in the world, had defected to bring news from Velka to the nameless king. They would gather an army of the remaining dragonkin at Lordron's doorstep, where their newly crowned dragon princess, Priscilla, and her power of life hunt awaited to bring war upon the gods once again. The occult rebellion which Velka had incited was swift and destructive. Their goal was to capture Nito and steal his power over death to decimate the ranks of Gwyn's forces. However, their plan ultimately failed before the might of Gwyn, his knights, and the other lords. And though Velka and the Nameless King somehow escaped with the few surviving dragons, Priscilla, Havel, and many of Velka's loyal followers were taken prisoner. Thus ended their short-lived rebellion. Havel the Rock was stripped of his noble armor and weapons and banished from Lordron. He would go on to join the nameless king in exile, protecting the dragons he had once nearly hunted to extinction. Priscilla and Velka's adherents, however, were too dangerous to be left unguarded. Gwyn would require a highly secure place to hold them, and for a time, he used a remote, 
human-made prison to suffice. But strangely enough, a young girl named Ariamis came to An Orlando soon after, offering her unique powers to build such a place. Though Gwen was skeptical of the girl's abilities and suspicious timing of her appearance, he nonetheless allowed Ariamis to complete her work. The painted world of Ariamis was its own universe, encapsulated within an otherwise normal-looking painting. Priscilla and the rest of Velka's followers were imprisoned there, a cold, dark, and very gentle place. Under constant watch by the same specialized guardians which had been studying Yorshka within her secret tower above, the enormous painting was hung in the empty chapel of Guinevere, a fitting place for her long-lost daughter Priscilla to spend the rest of her days. Beaten but not defeated, Velka settled in the land of Karim, where humans worshipped her as the goddess of sin. Gwyn, meanwhile, sat upon a lonely throne in An Orlando, his family shattered, abandoned by most of his fellow gods. All that mattered to him was the first flame, his own god and creator, for the flame still burned brightly, just as it did when it bestowed him life. Nito went into hiding after the occult rebellion, overcome with fear of the Dark Soul. Seath the Scaleless locked himself away in his archives, slowly driven to madness by the revelations of his twisted experimentation with souls and sorcery. And with the passage of time, even the eternal sunlight of An Orlando started to dim leaving Gwendolyn and Yorshka terrified of what Gwyn might do next. The primordial serpent, Koth, visited Kareem to let Velka know the time of dark would soon arrive. The first flame had begun to fade, and Gwyn watched as his last remaining hope for an enduring age of fire faded with it. Velka and Koth set out to prepare humanity for the coming Age of Dark. The Witch of Isolith, still fiercely loyal to the fire and fallen into desperation like Gwyn, devised a plan to use pyromancy to create a replacement for the first flame. Her new fire teemed with life, however, and instead unleashed cataclysmic destruction upon the city of Isleth. The living essence of the Chaos Flame birthed a horde of demons and transformed the witch and her daughters into twisted monstrosities. While Gwyn's Silver Knights sustained heavy losses in their battle against the demonic forces of Chaos, the actions of Velka and Koth had sown dark across the land. The power of the abyss, the pure darkness of untamed humanity, had taken over the city of New Londo on the outskirts of Lordron, threatening the first flame itself in its weakened state. Gwen sent Artorius, one of his personal guard, to quell the dark in New Londo, but the corrupting influence of the Abyss was already too strong to defeat. Artorius, tainted by the dark, escaped back to the royal court to be healed, and Gwen was forced to flood New Londo to contain the spreading Abyss, drowning every man, woman, and child in the city. As the war against the Chaos Demons waged on, another city on the outskirts of Lordron, Ulysseel, 
fell to the influence of dark. This time, Gwen sent all of his royal guard, but they were no match for the foe which had been awakened by the raging abyss in Ulusil. Manus, firstborn of Velka, heir to the Age of Dark. After sustaining heavy losses against the forces of chaos and learning of the dire situation in Ulusil, Gwen's desperation turned his thoughts towards a singular purpose. His Age of Fire was falling apart, but even if it cost him his own life, he would save the first flame. He would not watch his god, his parent, fade away, and he most certainly would not hand the world they had created over to the children of his nemesis, Velka. And so, Gwen offered his lord soul back to the first flame, reigniting its embers and prolonging the Age of Fire. For thousands of years, souls had only been taken from the flame, but when Gwen returned his soul, it changed the natural order of the flame's existence. Gwen's action saved the flame from going out, but also cursed the flame and all of the souls in the world which were fundamentally connected to it. The flame thirsted as it slowly faded once again, and the undead curse, a direct result of the flame's new need to burn ever onward, spread across the land, drawing souls to Lordron to repeat the cycle of the new world order. In the next episode of this series, we will revisit this story for comparison and contrast against similar mythological archetypes. I realize there are many events and characterizations contained in my version of the Age of Fire prior to the linking of the fire, which may contradict other popular interpretations. As I said in the last episode, I welcome all interpretations and I love that Dark Souls allows for personal perception to influence how individuals can relate to its story and experience. This is simply my version of events, and I hope that over the course of the following episodes, I can help better explain why I have come to these personal conclusions. For now, I leave you all with this, the item description of the peculiar doll found after returning to the Undead Asylum in Dark Souls. There was once an abomination who had no place in this world. She clutched this doll tightly and eventually was drawn into a cold and lonely painted world. Thank you for watching this episode of Dark Souls A New Mythology. This series is written and produced by me, Brian Edwards. Some of you may be familiar with my band, Soul Mass, where we've adapted the lore of Dark Souls to the sounds of punishing death metal and somber doom metal. The Soul Mass YouTube channel hosts this video series, so if you're interested in hearing more, you can check out some of our uploaded music here on the same channel. Music for Dark Souls A New Mythology was composed by Patches the Soundbringer. Yeah, bitches! If you'd like to listen to or purchase his music for this series, you can find a link to his Bandcamp page in the video description. Original artwork for the series was created by Samuel Nelson, you can find a link to his art page in the video description as well, where he sells original work and takes commissions if you're interested in art for an album cover, book cover, or other illustrations. 
Additional original artwork for the series was created by Unexpected Spectre and Jorge L. Perez. You can also find a link to their art pages in the video description. Narration was recorded at Sciatic Audio by Aaron Sluss <coughs> and engineered by Brett Wendagle at Hypometric Studio. The Dark Souls game footage used in this video was recorded by Devon Guy. He streams video games on Twitch, including lore-centric Soulsborne playthroughs. So check out his channel, linked in the video description, if you are interested in watching him play the games and hearing his take on Souls lore. Demon Souls, the Dark Souls series, and Bloodborne are properties of From Software, Namco Bandai, and Sony Interactive Entertainment. All of the videos, songs, images, and graphics used in this video belong to their respective owners, and I or this channel do not claim any right over them. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Until we meet again, my fellow undead, don't you dare go hollow. <laughs>